For growing numbers of white Britons, fantasies about hot interracial sex only made them want the real thing. The empire was moving into Africa. For many of the British colonial officers posted there, the temptation was going to prove too much. African women saw benefits in having relationships with local white men. If relations between white men and black women were causing anxiety, it was as nothing compared to the big fear that black men might have sex with white women. Other culture. Why were relations between the races so forbidden and yet so sexually charged? In the 1850s, the British Empire was in turmoil. In India, the natives were rebelling against British rule. The mutiny, as it was called, was crushed. But the way the British viewed non-white people changed forever. After the mutiny, Asians and Africans would have their own separate development, do their own thing. You wouldn't try and turn them into Europeans. So that distance, that difference, was a crucial thing. Over time, that really worked itself into the fabric of empire and ended up in an attitude of domination and superiority. Central to the empire's new governing philosophy was one simple rule. Don't sleep with the natives. Sex reduces everyone to equality. If you have sex with someone, you can't pretend to be their master or their mistress in quite the way that you can. If you don't, it's too subversive. Um, it causes too many difficulties. But the very act of forbidding interracial love only served to make it more enticing. At the same time, these others exert a powerful fascination. Now that becomes the area in which fantasy flourishes. A whole realm of fantasy connected with the figure of the exotic, um, the oriental, the negro. Increasingly, ordinary Victorian couples were using racial fantasies to spice up their sex lives. In 1854, Parlour maid Hannah Chadwick met Arthur Mumby, an outwardly respectable middle class lawyer. They fell in love, married secretly, and lived together, although never openly as husband and wife. But there was more going on than meets the eye. Behind the curtains of London's Six Big Tree Court, they shared an intense fantasy life built around elaborate, racially charged sex games. The Victorians were not as vanilla as they're made out to be. A lot of them seem to have included, shall we say, role-playing, and also, I think, things to do with dominance and submission. So, for example, we see Mumby, who was an extremely keen photographer, photographed Hannah dressed up as an upper middle class lady, as a milkmaid, complete with sort of churn and bonnet. Stripped to the waist and blacked up as some kind of a slave wearing a leather thong uh, around her wrist and a leather collar around her neck. Slavery had ended by 1838, but it left traces in the society in terms of um, imagery of sadomasochism. They're playing out what used to be real and brutal and cruel and barbaric in the plantation but they're doing it without the attendant realities of plantation life. It's not being translated into, into real action in terms of sort of racial su superiority and inferiority. So why not? You know, why not? Luckily for us, Arthur and Hannah kept diaries of what they got up to. Their games revealed just how central interracial sex had become in the erotic imagination of their day. Coming home at 2.30, I went down into the kitchen, and there I found my Hannah, in her dirt, looking like a chimney sweep. I'm blacking myself, Martha, said she, and still she looked noble, even in rags, in dirt, in the kitchen. He looked at her, 
a Juno carved in coal, with lustrous eyes and firm devoted soul, goddess within, magnificent and brave, yet outwardly a negress and a slave. One of Hannah's terms for Arthur was Massa, and if we put this with the game of blacking up, the game of wearing a leather thong or a leather collar, we can imagine that Hannah and Arthur are playing out an erotic relationship in dominance and submission, which draw on their differences as man-woman, as employer-employee, but also a fantasy which is a racial fantasy of racialized slavery. In her later years, Hannah moved away to a country cottage where she lived into her 70s. The parlor was reserved solely for Arthur's visits. It must have been spotlessly clean. I would imagine that in parts of Britain today where um, people of colour are not visible, fantasies probably still exist and there are probably all kinds of interesting games going on in suburbia. But they could never be as exciting as in the Victorian period because that initial excitement of discovering the new world and the new bodies of the new world, has, that has now gone. I think the Victorians had it good in terms of the facilities that they had to enact their sexual desires. For growing numbers of white Britons, fantasies about hot interracial sex only made them want the real thing. To do that, they had to travel abroad, where a whole new world of erotic possibility was opening up. The empire was moving into Africa. For many of the British colonial officers posted there, the temptation was going to prove too much. By the end of the 19th century, Britain was taking over large swathes of Africa, including today Zimbabwe, Kenya and Uganda. The carve-up had a side benefit. Interracial desire could at last become a reality. For some of Britain's colonial elite, a posting to some far-flung dominion might not be quite so hellish after all. You could almost think of it as a sex safari. It's almost like going to Mars, to a different planet, and finding out your astonishment and delight that the people were not just naked, but uh, the, they seemed to be welcoming at a sexual level, and more than that, you had power over them. It, it was a new world of sexual adventure. They knew they shouldn't, but they did. Typical of the new breed of administrator was Richard Meinertshagen, a 24-year-old British officer who arrived in the East Africa Protectorate, now Kenya, in 1902. Brought up a strict Christian, he believed in sexual restraint. He'd taken on board the Empire's cardinal rule, no sex with the natives. However, Minotargan was shocked to discover that the taboo was being broken extensively. Richard Minotargan discovers that all his brother officers appear to have African mistresses. There's definitely sexual relations going on. And Minot Hagen writes about these in his diaries and appears quite outraged by what he sees. On my arrival here, I was amazed and shocked to find that they all brought their native women into the mess. The talk centers around sex and money and is always connected with some type of pornography. Being very junior, I cannot do much about it. Soon after arriving, even Minot Hagen came perilously close to succumbing to the temptation on offer when he witnessed an erotic tribal dance. For a reserved young Brit, it must have been quite an eye-opener. The natives gave us a treat. A large party of young men and girls danced together for many a hot hour. To my mind, the dance was the most suggestive and immoral. I imagine the origin of all dancing is to incite or, or play on the sexual senses. In the dances I witnessed this afternoon, the last phase is the bolting of the lady into the bush, hotly pursued by the young man. 
a direct assault on my senses. Meinertshagen resisted the temptation throughout his five-year stay in Africa. But many of his fellow officers lacked his self-restraint. And it seems African women were often attracted to the colonizers as well. In certain African societies, whiteness is a blemish. In others, whiteness is just something to marvel at. When white people went, the natives fell on their knees and worshipped them <laughs> uh, as, as divinities. So obviously, whiteness had a glamour and a sense of marvel. African women saw benefits in having relationships with local white men. They're not in these relationships because white guys are seen as sexier than black guys. In the archives, you get reports of African male elders saying to white administrators, you white men have taken all our women. Well, of course you will have done, because you have the power. And it's part of the way in which the African societies have been constructed that more powerful men have access to more women. But it wasn't just about power. African women had a freer, less restrained attitude to sex. A lot of what's going on in Europe is to do with controlling sexual desire. And a lot of what's called sexual morality is actually the policing of desire. Now, in African communities at the same time, there is no real interest in policing desire. There is an interest in policing sexual relationships in order to make sure that children are born appropriately, that lineages continue, but desire itself is treated in a much more pragmatic way. Sex is fine, sex is good, sex is celebrated in these societies. Girls are encouraged to learn techniques to make sure that they and their husbands have a good time when they're having sex. You cannot regulate desire. We have records of African men saying this repeatedly to white administrators. You cannot police desire. London was a long way away, and the colonial office had loftier matters to pursue. They turned a blind eye to their minions' interracial affairs, hoping to keep it quiet from the public at home. There was plenty to keep quiet about. In some cases, sex with the natives meant sex with children, as young as 13. There is the view that forbidden fruit is unblemished fruit. What Africa seemed to have offered to jaded appetites was the possibility of virgin flesh, new flesh, you know, flesh that had not yet been um, sullied by contact. But by 1908, a scandal was brewing, which would blow the secret into the open. A white landowner in Kenya, W. Scoresby Routledge, objected to colonials having sex with young local African girls. Routledge complained to colonial officials, but they continued to look the other way. In frustration, he wrote a furious letter to the Times denouncing the immorality he had witnessed. The secret of interracial sex in Africa had just become a public scandal. Routledge made this a truly public issue, took it out of the private domain of the corridors of Whitehall and into the public arena. So questions were asked in the House of Parliament, and in one sense, I suppose, the cat was let out of the bag. The government's policy of don't ask, don't tell was in tatters. A circular went out to all colonial officers, banning relationships with the natives. But with the secret out, a new public mood was taking hold in Britain. If relations between white men and black women were causing anxiety, it was as nothing compared to the big fear that black men might have sex with white women.
It was called the Black Peril, and it stalked the Victorian's imagination. At the height of Black Peril scares, an African needs to do little more than bump into a white woman in the street to be accused of attempted rape. But were the scares based on fact or fiction? In October 1908, Mrs. Janet Faulkner took her dog for a walk in the town of Umtali in what was then southern Rhodesia. Miss Faulkner left uh, her place of work to go home after dark. She thought some person had jumped at her from behind and then she alleged attempted to rape her. The next morning, a local African man was arrested for the assault. The High Commissioner, Lord Selborne, ordered an investigation into the case. It was eventually discovered that one of the local African retainers at the railway station had a pet baboon, and that on the evening of the attack on Mrs. Faulkner, the pet baboon had escaped. Its handler had given chase and had seen the baboon jump upon Mrs. Faulkner and hit her. The reason for the baboon attacking Mrs. Faulkner was that she had a small dog with her and the baboon was afraid of the dog. Police later investigated all the cases of assault on white women between 1895 and 1920. They found fewer than one actual case every two years. In other words, a white woman had far more chance of being assaulted in the East End of London than she ever did in Kenya. But of course the knock-on effect of black peril scares is that the sexually predatory black man gets deeply embedded in the white psyche. And that has an impact, regardless of what African men are actually doing. We have that image of the black man looming over the vulnerable white woman. Back in Britain, the mythical black peril was creating moral panic. Now black men had to be kept apart from white women at all costs. But white women were proving harder to control. 